Change. 
had to go through Shine a light to bring somebody to you Jesus, I will go Even when I'm hurting To be standing When this trial's gone Let me be preaching That you did not forsake me Lose me for your glory takes a little faith to move a mountain a good thing a little faith is all I have right now so God when you choose to leave mountains unmovable oh and give me the strength to be Save through the fire with your mighty 
mighty hand, but even if you don't, my hope is you alone. I know the sorrow and I know the hurt would all go away if you just say the word.
Psalms 131, without question, and every signature that I have, and where some people have favorite verses and favorite chapters, this without any question is my favorite portion of the whole Bible. David is writing, and this is what he says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters. Or in things that are too high for me. He said, Lord, I'm not really trying to be anything more or anything less than what you desire for me and what you call for me to do. I don't have a prideful spirit. I'm not trying to covet or Have something that you don't want me to have. Lord, I'm just trying to be, even in the midst of my imperfections, what you want me to be. I don't exercise myself in great matters. I'm not not trying to be too big for my britches. I'm not trying to bite off more than I can chew and Get in water that is unchartered, that not even it's unchartered, but really it's not even my business to be in. So Lord, I, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a place right now to where I'm settled. I, I'm, I'm content. I'm content. He says, surely I behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned from his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. He says, I'm going to be honest with you, Lord. I'm at a place to where I have behaved and quieted myself. I've got to a place to where, Lord, I've, I've learned to grow. And the things that I used to have that was a source of strength, dependability, things that I relied on, things that were so much to me, Lord, I have weaned myself. There was a lot of things, Lord, that I gave to be weight in my life. But the same way that a child is, that it's weaned from its mother when it's a birth, where it has a source of food, where it gets a, a nu- nutrients, if you will, and they begin to break that, there's a whining, there's a breaking process. Lord, I just want you to know that I've been through the tough time, and God, I'm learning to learn my place. God, as tough as it is because it's outside of my comfort zone, God, I want you to know that I'm all right because as I said, Lord, I'm not going to exercise myself in great matters. I'm still in a weaning process, though I'm getting older, Lord. And then I believe with all question, you find the power in verse number 3. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. There's a power that's experienced. I began to write down things a number of years ago in a book where God and the Holy Ghost were put on my heart. And I want to think on this thought just quickly tonight because there ain't a whole lot to be able to share on it. But it's really been on me a whole lot. And today it honestly just kind of gripped my spirit. As I began to study, and we were going to be out of Genesis 3 thinking about the devil Preached three weeks on that. I was going to give you another lie that the devil has to tell you that sin don't have consequences. How many of you believe that that's a lie? Sin does have consequences. Somebody say amen. The Lord wouldn't let me go there. So I want to say these two words to you as a Christian. Don't quit. A study a couple years ago, I'd read some stories and books Thomas Edison said this, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. I'll read it again. Many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. Thomas Edison said that. 
Emerson said, A hero is no braver than any ordinary man, but he is braver five minutes longer. In other words, if you could just hold on and trust the Lord, God's going to carry you through. The difference in a quitter and somebody that succeeds is that one that's willing to pay the price in the dark place of life. That five minutes, that moment to where you lose your strength when you're holding on as tight as you possibly can. But no matter how tight your grip is, wearisomeness gets inside of your fingers. And the wearisomeness sits inside of your fingers and then it begins to get fatigue inside of your arms. And then somehow from the physical state of your arms and your fingers, it then gets inside of your mind and your mind can withstand it. But the moment you let the wearisomeness get inside of your heart is when quitting begins to settle in. Emerson said the only difference between a quitter and an ordinary man, a man that succeeds, is somebody that just waits five more minutes. One man said it this way, Winston Churchill said success is never final. But failure is never fatal. Success is never final. But failure is never fatal. I remember reading one time when I was talking to a man that has counseled me over five years. He told me to read in John chapter number 17. And I was thinking about the things that was inside of my mind of how I was going to be able to pursue and and not just face what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. Because I too, just like you, I want God to be able to use me whether I'm a pastor, a missionary, whether I'm sitting on the pew singing in the choir, whether I'm singing a song, whether I'm shaking hands at the door. It's not about a title. The Lord Jesus died for me and rose on the third day and he never quit on me. And I never want to quit on God. And he told me, he said, Brother Jason, I want you to study out John chapter number 17. For two weeks I studied it. I'd go back. I didn't have anything. On the third week I went back and I found in verse number four, and this is what the Bible says, Jesus is speaking. He said, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He said, you can't be Christ-like and even have in your mind that you have a chance and an opportunity to quit. If you're going to live a life that's going to be pleasing to God, you've got to make your mind up. You're going to press on. Paul said it this way, as most of us know, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 4. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Listen, I fought a good fight. I think it's a reality that what you got to understand that, listen, living a Christian life is not... A, a, a tiptoe park and, and, and playing around in leisure. It's not a cruise. It's not a fantasy. It's not a walk in the grass. It's, it's not a walk on the beach. It's a battlefield. It's a struggle. Every single day, day and night, the enemy might settle in on you. You can't lay down and let your soul be at rest and think that you got it figured out. It's never going to be that easy. There's never going to be a time out. There's never going to be a day off. There's never going to be a vacation. There's never going to be a time where spiritual war fair does not battle your mind there's no such thing and he said in the scripture I have fought a good fight I've faced some things in my life and when he said the words I fought a good fight he said the fights and the battles that I fought wasn't the battles that everybody else tried to entice me in that's why I failed many a times There's people even in this church week in and week out that, man, it constantly gives me a battle in my mind. They don't even know that the devil's using them. They don't even know that the enemy's using them. And I'm sitting there battling that battle, battling that battle, battling that battle. I'm worried about what they're dealing with. I'm worried about what they're struggling with. I'm worried about what's overcoming them. I'm worried about what's holding them back. I'm worried about why they can't get it right. I'm worried about what's going home. I'm worried why there's no shout, no tears, no happiness, no joy. And it's a constant battle. It might might not be for you but listen God called me I didn't sign up for it to be the under shepherd of this church that's a burden that I have to carry and there's burdens that you have to carry but we have to make your mind up I can't fight the battles that God don't call, uh, call me to fight I gotta fight the good fight that's the battles that God has called me to fight I've kept the faith I've kept the faith. I finished my course. 
That means I've got to a place where I can look back and I can see some things. I can look back and I can talk about some things. I can look back and I can tell you about some mountaintop experiences. I can tell you about the time when God sat down on this place. And man, I'd get up here when people wouldn't criticize about preaching and singing so much. And man, we would allow the Lord. And man, we'd be singing in the choir and the glory would fall down. People would run around with flags. They'd stand up and shout and say amen in the middle of change, in the middle of all the things that was going on. We still lifted up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can tell you about the times that God has reconciled and restored marriages. How God has helped friendships. How God has seen people say and helped people rise again a wall after temptation and failure in their life. I've seen people duplicate. I've seen people be, begin to disciple. I've seen Sunday school classes grow. I've seen ministries begin to grow. I've seen God answer prayer and put food on the table for people that never knew where God was going to put food on the table. I've seen God put money in the bank when it seemed like we was on the very end of trying to make things happen. I've seen some things. I can look back and I can rejoice. Hey, but let me tell you something, friend. I can also look back I can, I can look at the scars. I can hear the whispers. I can see the people cutting somebody deep. I can see the jerk, the jerking of the rug out from other people. I can see the enemy at times walking up and down the aisles and fighting people's minds. I can see people in their, la- in their lives and their marriages and their homes begin to be able to throw in the towel. I can see them in the choir. They sing and shout and weep. And then they don't sing and shout and weep. They don't cry no more. They don't worship no more. All they do is they do their little part. And you wonder why in the world we're still where we are because we're fighting some fights that are not our fights and we wonder God God how did I finish how did I finish in spite of all the good things and the bad things God how did I finish five five minutes a quitter I don't want to be known as a quitter. I don't want these kids to be known as a quitter. I know a lot of quitters. I've seen a lot of them sit on the very pews that you and I sit on. I've seen a lot of them sing in that choir. I've seen a lot of them serve in the ministry. I've seen a lot lot of it. And in the back of my mind as I begin to write these words few years ago he told me week after week when I'd go see him he said I want you to act like we're writing a book and every new week is going to be a new chapter and for three weeks we stayed on the same chapter and he said this is the title of your chapter don't quit he said I'll write it out what it takes to quit and I'm talking about people that get to a place to where you got more reasons to stop than you do to go on but you still have to tell yourself, don't quit. The Bible tells us, and I want to be able to differentiate if I can, what I mean by quitting. I'm not talking about quitting sin. The Bible makes it plain in the book of Psalms, chapter number 26, verse number 4. Listen to this. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in dissemblers. In other words, I'm not sitting with people who are useless, purposeless, or or maybe even at evil goals. I'm not sitting with that. In other words, it's all right to quit things that are evil and lead you to evil. I'm talking about not quitting what God has called you to do, where God has called you to be, and who God has called you to serve with. The first thing that I wrote down was this. A quitter, talking about the characteristics of what a quitter would be, a quitter foolishly buys into the same thought that everybody else does. The grass is always greener on the other side. Usually somebody that quits will get the mind made up. The grass is always greener on the other side. The grass is always greener on the other side. By saying that, I say it for this reason, because those types of people, and there's been times where you and I have been there. We live our life in the midst of frustration. We get frustrated. We get overwhelmed. We're unhappy with our environment. Why? Because we think that the grass is greener on the other side. It's so much better. Loop-de-doo, hunky-dory. It's so great. It's so wonderful. The grass is so green. No, just be honest with yourself. You're frustrated and unhappy with your environment. 
That's the truth. You can blame it on whatever you want to. But quitters can't blame nobody but themselves. Because it's you who allows your eyes to see what you see. And it's you that allows your mind to focus on what your mind focuses on. And it's you that allows the devil to use the mind to, as an as a avenue to your heart to change the same faith that was in your heart to dwindle down to where now there's no purpose to fight, as Paul said, the good fight. If everybody quits fighting the good fight, who fights it? Are you hearing me? If everybody quits fighting the good fight, who fights it? You want to sign up our kids? Would you love for our kids to bat battle spiritual warfare? How about our teenagers? Are they strong enough? Can they, can they deal with the enemy playing with their mind? Can they deal with the enemy coming inside of their head and telling them that there's no use to be able to go to church because everybody in the church is a hypocrite. It's watered down. It's not what it needs to be. Did we learn in the Word of God in the book of Genesis chapter number 3 that the devil is a deceiver? He will manipulate you. Whatever you will respond to is what he'll change to. Do you think that our kids can do it? Why quit? Why quit? Look in the faces. Just say, I'm not happy with the environment. The grass is greener on the other side. I'm not trying by any means to be sarcastic. But I've heard a lot of things being said about the grass being greener on the other side. Some people just say, well, they take better care of their lawn on the other side. That's why it's so green. I would dare say if we would tend to ours, maybe ours would look a little better too. And I'm talking about the house of God, the family, and the ministry we serve in. Let me ask you this, sir. How many days does your grass need to get to where it's knee high before you take responsibility and get out there and do it? Are you going to keep complaining about your grass not being what it needs to be? Or when are you going to tie your boots up and get outside and start mowing the grass in the neighborhood? Their yard might look like Sanford and Son, and it might look like junk. But why use the excuse that it's not good enough for you? Somebody's got to take responsibility and get out and fight the good fight. Ain't no time for no quitters. Ain't no time to be on the fence. Amen. Ain't no time for it. Ain't no time for it. My mama used to always say, too, it ain't always about somebody taking care of it. Sometimes it's just on top of manure. And y'all can read the rest of the story. Somebody say amen. My aunt raised me the latter part of my years. And I remember at the end of my Aunt Billy's lot, they used to live, and they still out, live out in Louisville. And we used to get up as kids, and we knew that there was bushes that was on the back side, and if you could hit to those trees over those bushes, it was a home run. Well, see, when I got a little bit older, I got smart. And the reason why I got smart is because I realized that they had a septic that was at the end of the yard. About 20 feet before those bushes, was the septic and didn't nobody run. So I knew if all I had to do was hit it to the septic, I was going to get a home run because didn't nobody want to run in the manure. Can I get an amen? In other words, it might be greener on the other side, but when you uncover it the way you've uncovered where you are, you're going to realize it might be a lot more stinkier there than what you're sitting on right here. You ever seen a husband that everybody says you got the best husband, but you live with him, you're like, you don't know him like I do? Can I get a witness? <laughs> Why? Because when you get close to somebody, Brother Sean, you don't just know the good, the outside, how beautiful we think our wives are. You know their insecurities. You know what they're like when they wake up. You know what they're like when they get tired. You know what they're like when they get, when they get hungry. You know what they're like when nobody else is around. And it's always easier to be able to say, I can jump ship and walk out the door. But just remember, the grass ain't always greener on the other side. Characteristics of a quitter is somebody that has the syndrome, the grass is greener. I want to share this with you because I wrote it down. 
The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse number 8, let us be, listen to this, let us be there with content. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. To fight off the syndrome of thinking that the grass is greener on the other side, you need to be content right where you are. Not in your environment, but in the person that you are serving. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Can I ask you something? If you believe that, why are we so apt to quit when things ain't right, things ain't good, and things ain't what we think they need to be? When we believe, teach, and preach, quote, and shout, and say amen, he'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. What does it say about our God when we're so easy to throw in the towel? Number two, a quitter is covered by unfulfilled expectations. You know what will make you quit? It's things just not being the way you want them to be. The psalmist said in Psalm 62, 5, My soul waits thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. That word expectation in the Hebrew is meaning this, to hope, to live, the thing that I long for. In other words, I can sit in the middle of the darkness and wait on the light. Why? Because my expectation is not based upon you, it's based upon him. And see, people that want to quit and people that make their mind up to quit, a good characteristic of them is when they've got things to where they're so filled up by unfulfilled expectations. Expectation, expectation, expectation. Do you know how many expectations we have of each other? And we wonder why we get so frustrated, get down and out, discouraged, because we got this great expectation of each other constantly thinking, this is the way that it needs to be. This is the way that it needs to be. No, this is the way that it needs to be. Your way ain't the right way. My way ain't the right way. Their way ain't the right way. And their way ain't the right way. It's the Bible way. That's the only way. And the last time I checked, there ain't nobody perfect. So the best thing we could do is be the light of the world. Learn to live in a dark place. Stand up for Jesus. Preach Jesus, love Jesus, live for Jesus, tell everybody about Jesus. That's the only way to live for God and never to quit. The problem is, is we got unfulfilled expectations. Unfulfilled expectations. Therefore, we find ourselves with disappointments. We try to carry on. My counselor told me these words one day. He was in the military. He served in the military. And he said one time that he was on a, on a ship. And he gave me this quote. He said, a lot of the sailors will always say this. You don't change ships in the middle of a storm. Sometimes he's got a way of saying some things. And I don't really know what they mean until I walk out the door, sit in my car, and start riding down the road. Y'all ever been like that before? I'm in the Bible tonight. Y'all stay with me. I promise you. I know. I, 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 I'd love to be able to preach out Genesis 3. I think God's been using that. But man, I'll tell you, I just, if it ain't nothing, maybe it's just me and the Lord and the devil tonight. We're just trying to have a battle right here. We're going to see who wins. I know who's going to win. It's going to be God. Amen. He said, Jason, it ain't every time to change ships in the middle of a storm. No matter what it is, no matter how hard it is, no matter how rough it gets, no matter how lonely and afraid you may be, and the water's crashing and the darkness in the middle of the night and the loneliness and the silence when it seems like that nothing is going on, it's never time to change ship in the middle of the storm. I had to put Bible to it, Bible, Psalms 107, verses 28 through 30. Listen to this. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the, the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then, then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. You know why? Because they haven't quit. Sometimes we never see where God's trying to take us because we quit too soon. 
Sometimes we never see the storm calm because we quit too soon. The third thing that I'd say to you is quitters try to assume a role which they are not called to do and are not ready to do. I know these are simple principles tonight, but I'm trying to help you. So let me make it plain to you. Quitters are somebody that thinks that the grass is greener on the other side. Quitters are somebody that has unfulfilled expectations. And number three, quitters are somebody that does something that they're not called to do nor ready to do. In 2 Samuel chapter number 15, verse number 4, listen to what Absalom, what was said. Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which had any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. In other words, He's in a place where he is miserable. You know why? Because he's done something that he shouldn't have done. And anytime you do something that God has not called you to do, you will be miserable. The greatest fear of my life is leading those that's on my ship, being my son and my wife, and the church for that matter, but especially my wife and myself, above all people, Above all people, my son and my wife, leading him based upon emotion and not by what the Word of God has clearly said to me. Because not only days, but weeks and months and years to come, I might learn to exist, but deep inside, I of all people would be most miserable. You know how hard it would be for me to look my family in the eyes? Quitters are somebody that says, I'll do it, but that's not what God called you to do. Be careful. It might just be your soul speaking to you and not the spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm going to hurry. Number four. Miss Deborah, you can come. Let me give you two more things. Y'all stay with me. This one right here got me about about the second year of my pastorate, right after I started, we were doing this, and when we got here, this got me. Quitters nurture a root of bitterness. Somewhere down the line, if somebody quits, it's because they're bitter. Are you hearing me? If somebody quits, they're bitter. Somebody that gets to a place to where they realize that it's not where they think it needs to be. One man said it this way, bitterness is the only chemical that destroys the container that holds it. Bitterness is the only thing that destroys the container that holds it. That means not only Bitterness itself, but what bitterness is sitting in, it will destroy it too. I wonder how many of us are sitting destroyed because of bitterness. Because of bitterness. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Bitterness defiles, you want to make it plain. Bitterness defiles. To be honestly, to be honest with you, bitterness will get to a place to where not only will it ruin you, but it'll ruin everybody else's world that's around you. People can't talk to you, people can't associate with you, people can't speak to you. And you can't speak to them. They don't know whether to approach you, not to approach you, how to hug you, how to love you, how to talk to you. And the devils already act like they're an issue, and there ain't no issue. The issue's on the inside. There's a problem. If there wasn't a problem, you put the best foot forward, and you'd make it work. But it's kind of hard for us to do that sometimes. Bitterness don't just pray through, brother. Quit that jump. Sorry for being plain, but ain't got that time to be sissified. I just pray through. It'll be all right. Keep lying to yourself. Keep lying to yourself. Because there ain't but two types of what the Bible says as far as forgiveness. Unilateral and transactional. The unilateral says, I'm going to forgive so I can move on. Because you're never going to forgive. We're never going to make things right. So I'm going to move on. So I'm going to be okay and I'm going to be approachable. But transactional says, hey brother, I'm sorry. Hey sister, I'm sorry. So if you're not forgiving unilaterally and being okay, then you're sitting in the middle of bitterness. And everybody 
around you is miserable too. They don't even know what to think. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to respond. They don't know whether to go eat, to ask you to go eat, to ask your kids to go eat, whether your kids ask them to go eat. Can so-and-so spend the night? Can so-and-so come over? Can we sing in the choir? Can we hang out? Can I stay here? Can I stay? Because they're scared to death because bitterness sits inside of you. So everybody around you, those beyond you, those behind you that you're leading, and those that's leading you, they're all scared to death. Because bitterness sits inside of you. And as the Bible says, bitterness defiles and ruins. You know what made me get my heart right over the last 14 years? We'll just say it like that with some situations in my life. So I'll be honest with you, friend. I can't be halfway or halfway in. I can't be one way or one other. I, I've got to be all in or all out. And if I got half in and I've got half out, you might as well just count me out because I'm not going to do it. I just can't be that way. I'm not made that way. I'm not made that way. You know why I came to church all, this is me. You know why I came to church all the time when I got saved? Because I was so scared to death of who I was, I had to come to church. I had to come to church. Y'all hearing me? I had to come to church. Because I, I knew that inside of me, I had to overcome some things. And listen, man, I'm talking about things that, that my mom and my dad, when they were young and they were married and we were together, and we lived in the little house on the prairie house that I thought, that bitterness that they had at each other ended up getting bitterness inside of me. To where when I got to be a man and I got a family, I'm spending week after week after week after week after week, 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 after week. In the Bible, the Word of God, and talking to a counselor. Getting down with my Heavenly Father. Telling somebody, tell me what God's telling you because I can't just go say, hey, Brother Shane, this is what I got. Hey, Brother Sean, this is what I got. Hey, Brother Danny, this is what I got. But I got to get somebody Every pastor needs a pastor. Every leader needs a leader. Every mentor needs a mentor. Everybody needs somebody. And it was when I was a child, when I was looking. You don't think that's why a lot of people don't go to church today? Let me say this, friend. Be careful because your kids and my kids might be the same way. What's the point? bitterness. Last thing, I'm done. Quitters. Are always on a, on a self-destructing mission. Quitters are always on a self-destructing mission. No matter what happens, the end is never right. Listen to me, I'm done. You remember when I said don't quit? Don't quit. Let me give you these four things. Quitters usually quit because they're, they're walking a road that has been misguided by unconditional love. I, wrote, I mean, I wrote this down. This is, this is true stuff for me when I did this. My wife, my family's never read this stuff. Due to bad experiences of the past, one believes that no one loves them unless they are performing in a way to please others. That's what I wrote down. Therefore, to test that love, they quit doing right. They walk away from doing right. But the reason why we do that is because if we get rejected, we get fired, or we get pushed away, then that's our excuse of why we quit. No, the reason why we quit is because we never understood unconditional love. Because people that have unconditional love will look beyond anything and help somebody. The re second reason is this. They believe that a situation or conflict will jumpstart a new life, so they quit. You know why we quit? We think that 
confrontation and issue and conflict will always lead us to something better. And we'll even get as far as that I've got and say, well, you know, the Bible teaches that. See, Paul and Barnabas, they loved the Lord. And they had conflict. And it wasn't conflict that was on doctrine. It was conflict that was on personal preference. And the Bible says that they split ways. But God used both of them. But let me just say this. Don't condone what you're doing because the Bible says there's an illustration of it. Because if God don't tell you, remember what I said? You're at best miserable. Third thing. We take counsel from immature people because we get to our place of being in a confused state of mind. Fourth thing. We enter out to a place of quitting because of a state of rebellion. We really just don't want to face what we have to face. I want to remind you what I said when I first started. Two words. Listen to me. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Y'all give me some time. I'm done, okay? Don't quit. Don't quit. Whatever you're doing, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Not being silly. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't let your fingertips get tired. Don't let it get down into your wrist. Your wrist to your forearms, that grip. Your forearms to your biceps. Your biceps to your shoulders. Now it's in your mind. When it gets in your mind, now you're asking yourself, can I hold on? Can I make it work? Can I endure? Can I press on? Can I outlive what's causing me so much pain? If you're not careful when it gets to your mind, it's going to get to your heart. And when it gets to your heart, it'll control everything else. I don't care who this is for. And I sure don't know what 2018 has for Haynes Baptist Church. But I want to tell you as a child of God. Don't let the enemy take what he has no authority to take from you. Because if you quit, you're giving him the keys to what God's promised you. Let God help you. Learn to be weaned, as David said. When I'm outside of my comfort zone, when I'm outside of my comfort zone, though it ain't been easy, Lord, I've learned learned to trust in you. Father, help us tonight. Help us to dig deep. Use your word. Use your principles. Jesus' name. Amen. As the pastor, I want to thank you for viewing our video today. However, if God's dealt with your heart, we do not want to end this video without giving you a chance to be able to accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. If you're there today and God's actually dealing with your heart, I want to remind you what the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every single one of us has had problems, issues, sin, failures, faults in our past. The great thing is this, is that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming through the Father but by me. There is a way to be able to have hope, to have eternal security within the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to know that you're saved by the grace of God. Now the great thing about the Bible is it tells us about the love of God. He says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that's amazing to a lot of people, and they can quote it. But the beauty of it is this, is the very next verse tells us the purpose of Christ. Because the Bible says, For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That means that God sent his son to die for those of us who are sinners so that we can have fellowship with God himself. Now, if you're there today and God's really been dealing with your heart, I want to ask you this question. Do you really believe that God's been dealing with you about salvation? If that's the case today, then I want to tell you what you need to do is repent of your sins. You need to die to yourself. Admit that you're lost and you're on your way to hell. And then look at what the Bible tells us, that He tells us that we can be saved through Christ. Who do you call on? There's only one. Because the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Christ and Christ alone. So I tell you today, would you trust in Christ? 
I want to ask you would, you, would you trust in Him as a personal Savior? You say, Brother Jason, I don't really know if I can do that. Well, let me tell you, the Bible also tells us that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It don't matter who you are, where you come from, God sent His Son to die for everyone. If you've made this decision today to be able to trust in Christ, to be able to die to yourself, to, to be able to start living for Christ and accept Him as a personal Savior after repenting, would you do us a favor and be able to contact us at 336-788-0551 and let us know about this decision that you made so we can start praying for you. Thank you so much.